Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to CS492F, Futures of the World. We are today and this entire week talking about topic C, Futures of Ecology and Sustenance. This topic has been prepared and will be presented by Jimin, by Dilnas, and by Amen. So how about Jimin, Dilnas, and Amen? You turn on your video, and I'm going to put the spotlight on you. And uh, I'd like to suggest that you first introduce yourself and give an overview of uh, uh, the presentation, who is going to present what. OK, so. There's spotlight and spotlight and spotlight. Yes. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Amin, and I will be presenting first. Our presentation is divided into three parts for today the current problems we're facing, environmental problems we're facing, the future challenge and innovative technologies. And I'll be presenting the current problems. Hi, my name is Jimin and I'm presenting about the future challenges today. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lina. Now I'm presenting the technological solutions that will be used in the future. Imagine a world where forests like this one stretch as far as the eye can see, teeming with life and providing sustenance for both nature and humanity. This vision is not a distant dream, but rather the potential future we can shape together. Welcome to the discussion on the future of ecology and sustenance. We are Group C and I am Amin. I'll be with you for the first part of the presentation. Every year, Forests like the one in this image absorb billions of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, acting as the Earth's lungs and helping to regulate our climate. Yet they are under threat. Today, we stand at a critical crossroad where the choices we make will determine whether this future of ecological abundance becomes a reality or remains an elusive dream. In today's presentation, we'll explore the challenge our planet is facing currently, what the future looks like in terms of challenge, and the innovative strategies and technologies that offer hope. Let us begin with an understanding of the current state of our environment and the urgency of the issue at hand. Our environment is constantly changing. However, as our environment changes, so does the need to become inc increasingly aware of the problems that surround it. With a massive influx of natural disasters, warming and cooling periods, different types of weather patterns, and much more, we need to be aware of what types of environmental problems our planet is facing. One of the biggest problems we are facing is climate change and global warming. Let us watch this video to see how climate change is caused and its impacts. from pollution to overpopulation are driving up the Earth's temperature and fundamentally changing the world around us. The main cause is a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. Gases in the atmosphere, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons, let the sun's light in, but keep some of the heat from escaping like the glass walls of a greenhouse. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped, strengthening the greenhouse effect and increasing the Earth's temperature. Human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels, have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by more than a third since the Industrial Revolution. The rapid increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has warmed the planet at an alarming rate. While Earth's climate has fluctuated in the past, 
atmospheric carbon dioxide hasn't reached today's levels in hundreds of thousands of years. Climate change has consequences for our oceans, our weather, our food sources, and our health. Ice sheets, such as Greenland and Antarctica, are melting. The extra water that was once held in glaciers causes sea levels to rise and spills out of the oceans, flooding coastal regions. Warmer temperatures also make weather more extreme. This means not only more intense major storms, floods, and heavy snowfall, but also longer and more frequent droughts. These changes in weather pose challenges. Growing crops becomes more difficult. The areas where plants and animals can live shift and water supplies are diminished. In addition to creating new agricultural challenges, climate change can directly affect people's physical health. In urban areas, the warmer atmosphere creates an environment that traps and increases the amount of smog. This is because smog contains ozone particles, which increase rapidly at higher temperatures. Exposure to higher levels of smog can cause health problems such as asthma, heart disease, and lung cancer. While the rapid rate of climate change is caused by humans, humans are also the ones who can combat it. If we work to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy sources like solar and wind, which don't produce greenhouse gas emissions, we might still be able to prevent some of the worst effects of climate change. Human activities, from pollution to over... At the end of the video, we heard that while the rapid increase in climate change is caused by humans, we are also the ones who can combat it. So currently, humans are putting forward adaptation and mitigation efforts. Adaptation is the adjustment we need to make for a changing climate, while mitigation is reducing the causes of climate change. These efforts are focused on tra transitioning to renewable energy sources, improving energy efficiency, reforestation and afforestation, implementing carbon pricing mechanisms, adhering to international climate ag agreements like the Paris Agreement, promoting sustainable transportation and agriculture, raising public awareness, and encouraging corporate responsibility. These strategies aim to reduce greenhouse gas emission and limit global warming, but their effectiveness varies by region and depends on the cooperation of governments, business, and individuals. Climate change may act as a significant great filter for advanced civilizations. If a society cannot effectively address and mitigate climate change, it could become a major hurdle in its development. Climate change consequences such as severe weather events, resource scarcity, and social instability could stall or collapse civilizations at different stages of advancement, from early industrialization to the brink of interstellar exp exploration. This suggests that climate change could be a key factor in explaining the Fermi paradox and the absence of advanced extraterrestrial civilizations in our universe. Another environmental problem we face is biodiversity loss and habitat destruction. Primary drivers for this are habitat loss, invasive species, overexploitation, pollution, and climate change. It's important to recognize how one environmental problem can trigger a chain reaction leading to a cascade of interconnected environmental issues. For instance, pollution affects climate change, which also affects biodiversity, and biodiversity loss in turn affects climate change and the overall productivity and quality of an ecosystem. In terms of great filter relevance, biodiversity loss can lead to disruptions within ecosystems, which in turn have far-reaching implications for the sustainability of human civilization. This connection is significant in the context of the great filter hypothesis, showing the potential risks associated with neglecting biodiversity loss, which could hinder the progress and resilience of civilizations. Pollution and environmental degradation. This problem is also another famously known problem. Pollution is the introduction of substances or energies that cause adverse changes in the environment and living entities. 
There are various types of pollution, air, water, soil, and noise pollution. However, I'd like to shift our focus to plastic pollution. To see how this type of pollution degrades our environment, let us watch the video. The amount of solid plastic waste produced since the 1950s that has not been burned or recycled is around 4.9 billion tonnes. This could all have been dumped into a 70 metre deep landfill the size of Manhattan. While much of it has indeed ended up in landfill around the world, far too much of it has found its way into the natural environment, with around 10 million tonnes a year ending up in the ocean. Over half of all plastic is used just once and then thrown away, taking hundreds of years to decompose. Apart from the perception that plastic waste is ugly and unnatural, it has also been known to harm marine animals, and exposed to salt water and sunlight, it can fragment into microplastics, which some people fear can poison sea life and humans who subsequently consume it. But is it as big an environmental problem as the plastic panic across the rich world suggests? Plastics account for just 10% of the 1.3 billion tonnes of waste produced globally every year. Air pollution is blamed for 7 million deaths per year worldwide. Ocean acidification, the result of man-made carbon dioxide emissions, is disastrous for coral reefs and many other forms of sea life. In any case, efforts are being made to improve the situation or at least lessen the impact of plastic. In 2008, Rwanda introduced strict laws banning plastic bags and many countries have since followed with similar initiatives. In December 2017, 193 countries committed to a UN plan to stop plastic waste entering the ocean. To eliminate plastic waste reaching the natural environment, it must first be collected in developed countries, virtually all of it is. But five countries in Asia are dumping more plastic into the oceans than the rest of the world combined. If the world wants to tackle plastic pollution, then it should first concentrate its efforts on the biggest culprits in Southeast Asia. Until it does, all other efforts will be a drop in the ocean. The amount of solid plastic waste produced since the 19th Let us move on to the great filter relevance of pollution. By affecting our planet's habitability, human health, resource availability, and ability to, to develop advanced technologies and global cooperation, it could be a factor in the hypothetical great filter, a concept that suggests that it may hinder the emergence and survival of intelligent civilizations. So yeah, our inability to effectively manage pollution could be a critical challenge for our future existence. The final problem we're gonna look at is resource depletion and food insecurity. The depletion of natural resources occurs when resources are consumed at a faster rate than that of replacement. A resource that is rare on earth due to depletion has a higher value than a natural resource that is in abundance. Driving factors for resource depletion are overpopulation, poor farming practices, overconsumption of natural resources, pollution, and industrial and technological development. And to see the causes and some truths about food insecurity, let us watch this final video. Human-induced climate change threatens our existing food supplies as fresh water begins to run out in many hotter regions. The rise in temperatures also allows new pests to survive in regions that were previously too cool, wiping out entire years' worth of crops and causing famines in some regions of the world. Yet another factor adding to food insecurity is the ever-rising cost of producing food. Farmers at the bottom of the food production process earn little to nothing for their goods, and many are forced to buy seasonal seeds from multinational corporations, meaning that every year they need to buy more or fail to produce their crops. Food production is now part of a global system designed to generate capital, not ensure food security. So why are all these problems worsening to the extent that they threaten that most basic necessity of life? The most vocal claim that population growth is the real problem. Too many mouths to feed and too little food to go around. The Malthusian theory of exponential growth. 
While this theory is likely correct for any system with limited resources, it did not take into account more modern methods of production, and it would only become a problem for us once we exhausted our tremendous supply of resources. But is our current problem really one of population overshooting resources, or is it more insidious? Is food insecurity just an inevitable consequence of humanity's growth, or could it be due to other factors? Maybe our running out of food is not due to the number of people we need to feed, but to a system that is failing to do its supposed job. Here are a few facts that should make it obvious there is something going terribly wrong with our global food system. One third of all food produced globally goes to waste. 1.3 billion tons, or one trillion dollars of food, are wasted every year. And just one quarter of the food wasted by the EU, UK, and US could feed all the world's hungry. There are many other statistics like this, but all of them point to one simple fact. There is more than enough food for everyone, but our food system guarantees that some will go hungry. We do not currently have a problem of supply and demand, we have a problem of production and distribution. Food insecurity is not a natural result of population growth, but a man-made crisis caused by a failing, inhumane system. As with many basic human necessities under a capitalist system, food is a commodity to be traded in order to make a profit. The more food we produce and sell, the more money there is to be made. So under the guise of tackling food security to provide for all, we have developed intensive farming methods to produce ever greater quantities at ever lower prices. This race to the bottom in food prices has come at tremendous cost, both in terms of food quality and environmental damage. We have built ever more efficient methods of trawling the seas, more efficient ways of jamming livestock into small spaces, and more efficient ways of producing more crops on less land. For decades, the environmental cost of these practices was ignored and any way to improve yield was seen as a good way forward. Today, we are finally realizing the price we're about to pay for such reckless intensification of food production. Fish is the number one source of protein in the world, yet 80% of the world's fish stocks are overfished and on the brink of collapse. Super trawlers continue to destroy seabeds and pull out hundreds of tons of fish every year, regardless of size, age, or species. The trawling done in the North Sea alone is equivalent to bulldozing the Amazon rainforest seven times a year. At the current rate of destruction, the world will run out of seafood in 2048, at which point food insecurity will affect billions across the planet. The impact of agriculture on the world's ecosystems by far eclipses the damage done by any other industry. As we continue to wrestle with a worldwide pandemic, we may want to pause and think about how the meat and dairy industries have been contributing to the development of super pathogens for several decades. In the US, 80% of all antibiotics produced by pharmaceutical companies are sold to be used on animals. The appalling conditions factory animals live in force them into such close and constant contact that the only way to avoid disease outbreaks is to pump them full of antibiotics. We know that overuse of these drugs is the most likely factor to lead to antibiotic-resistant diseases, some of which may evolve to become unstoppable. When this happens, the impact on the human food supply will be devastating. It isn't just antibiotics, though. Raising animals to be used as food produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector. This is made worse by the ever-increasing deforestation of vast parts of the Amazon and other rainforests, which in turn releases more carbon from cutting trees. Destroying forests to raise cattle or grow single crops causes the loss of essential biodiversity and leaves our food supply vulnerable to disease and climate change, as single species do not have the resilience of whole ecosystems. Finally, manure and waste from intensive animal agriculture cause eutrophication, the death of lakes and rivers covered by algal blooms, and ocean dead zones, turning freshwater toxic and killing millions of aquatic animals. All this to produce a food that consumes billions of gallons of water, countless acres of land, and tons of crops that could otherwise be used for humans. Converting crops into meat is the most inefficient way of using the food we grow and is directly responsible for worsening the climate and food crises we've caused. The environmental damage goes on, but the purpose of this video is not to discuss the negative effects of modern agriculture, but rather to point out how relying on this system to produce our food will inevitably lead to a climatic collapse which will destroy our food supply and leave billions to starve. So why do we keep going? Why don't women-induced climate change threatens our existing food Uh, finally, let us look at the great filter relevance of this environmental problem. Resource depletion and food insecurity on Earth is could be on potential filter. While humanity faces resource challenge, there are efforts to explore space for alternative sources. 
resources. Whether humanity becomes extinct due to resource depletion depends on our ability to find sustainable solutions both and on Earth and beyond. Success is not guaranteed, but careful planning and wise, wise choices can help us improve our chances of, our, of overcoming this challenge. Thank you, everyone. Now my teammate, Jimmy, will present future challenges. Uh, okay, I start. Hi, my name is Jimin, and Eamon talked about the current ecological and environment problems. And in this part, I'll discuss about the future challenges and changes for the environment that will come in the future. Have you heard of the term green tech? Green tech is the general term for environmentally friendly technologies. Until now, humanity has developed technology for more effective and faster production. As they have experienced environmental pollution, disasters, and global warming, humans have felt that further indiscriminate development would stop. Accordingly, this term, the green tech, was born. Recently, various technologies have emerged under so-called fourth industrial revolution. Typical things that come to mind, including AI, 3D printers, and IoT. So what impact will these technologies have on the environment, better or worse. The type of new technology we are most familiar with is probably AI. So is AI technology a green tech? Let's watch this video for a while. One of the, one of the biggest issues confronting the world today is the impact that we human beings are having on the planet. Human beings are flying the planet, but they're flying blind. And flying blind is very dangerous. There's a poem by Philip Larkin where he mourns the current state of the world. And then he says, but at least somewhere there'll be a clean ocean untouched by humanity that will always exist. We are poisoning the last wild environment that we had. We receive a lot of our food from the ocean it's the basis of the environmental system. We need a solution to creating or recreating the clean oceans that we had. Now, there's some really interesting experiments that you might run. You could put algae back in the ocean. There are a bunch of things that we could do. No one wants to run these large geoengineering experiments on a real global scale. What you want is to run them in simulations. And AIs might do that in a way that you could at least begin to experiment with and gain large public support for. The main problem that we have right now is that we don't understand how these systems work, right? Ecosystems are very complex. Everything interacts with everything. And we don't know what the impact is of what we do, but with more sensors and better machine learning to build models based on those sensors, we can actually understand how a whole ecosystem works. So with climate, we have the problem that some people are modeling how the ocean currents work. We have other people who are modeling the reflectivity of the ice caps, but we currently don't have a great way to merge all of these independent models together and be able to actually understand it as a global system. So we have more sensors, we have more data, but now we need to use that to have models of how ecosystems function, how different species, down even to individual organisms interact, how you know the things that we're you know putting into the atmosphere change the climate, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can actually do the following thing, which is we can simulate an ecosystem on a computer, and then we can we can see what are the impacts of doing different things. And then we can do those things that actually, for example, give us the most gain for what we want while minimally impacting the ecosystem. And we also, for example, use it to understand which species really are important and which species are less important, right? Because at the end of the day, we often have to make hard trade-offs. And sometimes species that look very insignificant. As shown in the previous video, AI clearly has its advantages. It can be used for an effective environmental monitoring and also can be used for simulation to predict the future. But AI requires bigger data centers and electricity hungry components for better performance. And these are not clearly not environmentally friendly. As the white graph shows, in the future by 2030, the amount of power used by data sensors centers is expected to increase by twice the current amount. In the aspect of energy consumption, 
AI may not be a sustainable technology. What about 3D printers? Because it is a technology that allows you to create what you want on the spot, making small products is much more environmentally friendly than building a factory for the products. However, as the size and quality of the product increases, the efficiency will decrease. There is also a problem that the melted polymer generated views the volatile organic compound, which causes air pollution and creates smoke. The future of building houses and cooking food with 3D printers is a reality that is soon approaching. But there are problems that must be solved in order to have a positive impact on the environment. IoT may also be a technology we are familiar with. Is this, a, is this a technology that can be used for the environment? Let's watch this video about IoT and environmental monitoring. Supriya Prasanan, Head of Legal for Ericsson Malaysia, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. I'm here to tell you a story about the Connected Mangroves Project, which is the first of its kind in the world. It all began in 2015 as a project to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Ericsson Malaysia. 50 employees volunteered to plant 200 mangrove saplings in a coastal community at Kampung Dato Hormat, Sabah Pernam in Selangor. It was there that we saw firsthand the devastating effects of the mangrove deforestation to the environment. And when we asked the community about the planted saplings, they said maybe 30% would survive and reach maturity. So as a technology leader, we decided to help and we partnered up with an, a local NGO, a sensor partner, and we brought up this new project called the Connected Mangrove, where we install sensors and cameras to monitor real-time information about the soil, the water, the weather conditions, as well as the risk to the mangroves. Based on these data they generated, the local community has been able to take timely interventions, increasing the survival rate from a 30% to 80%. The saplings have grown so much that it's actually covering our sensors and the solar panel. It is so wonderful for us to see the wider effect of this project. The ecosystem of the mangrove is thriving. And for example, crab fishing has re-emerged as a form of the livelihood for the local community and the forest is now protecting the erosion and the flooding for that community. And we have an empowered community who believes in this mangrove. We are also honoured to have received the United Nations Momentum for Change Award for this project in recognition of its impact Ericsson's technology has had to the environment and to community. What makes me really, really happy about this project is the power of technology for good. Imagine if we could reverse the negative impacts on the environment with projects like these. As seen in the video, IoT would be an excellent tool as a technology for continuous monitoring and management. However, as IoT is a technology linked to hardware, it has its own limitations. The first risk is that IoT requires more sensors and hardware components to perform its work well. Followed by this first risk, there is also a second risk that it requires continuous hardware management to prevent aging and malfunction. In order for IoT to become green technology, there should be a way to minimize and recycle hardware waste. Not only this, but many other technologies will emerge in the future, such as drones, biotech, and virtual reality. However, it is difficult to predict what impact these technologies will ultimately have on the environment. As shown in the previous three technologies, they have both pros and cons. But one thing is certain, the emergence and proper use of new technologies will become a critical challenge for the environment and sustainability. Environmental changes brought by new technologies are very important, but there are other critical future challenges. The sustainability issue due to rapid population growth. 
According to the statistics, the number will increase up by up to 3 billion in the future of 2100. So how do we prepare homes and food for that population? And how can we do that eco-friendly? Will it be possible to create a green city that can accommodate the girls growing population and at the same time takes the environment into consideration? The problem of population will also be an obstacle for the sustainability issue in the future. So my part for discussing about the future challenges and changes for the environment is done here. And then next, we discuss about the technological solutions. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. So far, Amy discussed the existing problems in ecology, and Jimin talked about our predictions towards the future of this area. Now, let me introduce myself. My name is Tanaz, and I'd like to present the technological solutions that we believe will be widely used in the future. We will touch upon on innovative trends in the sustainability and ecology fields. Let's begin with a closer look at renewable energy and green technology. Renewable energy now has evolved into a symbol of hope in our pursuit for a greener world. Solar, wind, and hydroelectric power stand at the front of sustainability energy production. The actions made so far in development of these technologies have transformed them not just into another alternatives for energy, but a serious contender to the traditional fossil fuels. Moving on, let's turn our attention to a critical aspect of this sustainable energy revolution, the energy storage. One of the vital components of a sustainable energy future lies in how we store the energy that is generated from the renewable sources. Technological breakthroughs in energy storage have been exceptional. And we believe that soon we're going to witness the development of advanced battery technologies that are not only more efficient, but also capable of storing large amounts of energy. Additionally, today, large scale energy storage solutions are emerging, ensuring a stable and reliable energy supply, even when uh, renewable sources aren't actively generating power. So some of you might be wondering, what does even uh, matter this all to us? It all ties back to a concept we continuously discuss throughout this course, the grid filter. Shifting towards sustainable energy sources is crucial in overcoming the potential filters that could stem from resource overuse and environmental degradation. Now let's watch a short video that discusses why we should care about this issue. There's no audio. I'm sorry. Um, let me try again. As it was discussed in the video, we should care about this issue so we can prevent the Earth from going the way that it was depicted in this video. And by reducing our dependence, uh, dependence on the scarce resources and reducing the impacts of conventional energy production, we can guide ourselves to navigate potential ecological challenges. Now, let's shift our focus to another uh, point of ecological progress, the AI and data-driven solutions. Artificial intelligence plays a substantial role in our efforts to monitor and safeguard the environment. Through sophisticated algorithms, we can analyze the extensive data sets to track wildlife population, 
discover shifts in ecosystems, and even anticipate the potential environmental threats. This represents a significant potential in our capacity to comprehend and protect the natural world. Additionally, advanced data analytics assumes a pivotal role in resource management. By leveraging data-driven insights, we can optimize resource allocation and reduce waste and make informed decisions that promote sustainability. It's about enhancing efficiency and making conscious use of our invaluable scarce resources. Finally for today, let's turn our attention to the concepts of the circular economy and sustainable practices. Promoting resource efficiency revolves around the notion of minimizing waste and extending the life cycle of products and materials that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Through practices, <clears throat> I'm sorry, like <clears throat> recycling, upcycling, and acid resource utilization, we markedly reduce our environmental footprint. It signifies a shift towards more conscious and responsible consumption patterns, which <clears throat> In the long run, we believe will become the basis for human action. Moving on, right now industries are embarking on a paradigm shift, reimagining production processes to center around the sustainability. This isn't just a conservation effort, but a catalyst for innovation and economic development. Circular economy models not only conserve resources, but they foster resilience and take us into a new era, a sustainable industry. And we believe in the future, more and more companies will shift along this paradigm. So we finally discussed all the topics that we wanted to share with you today. Now let's move on to the next session of our presentation, the discussions and Q&A session. For the first discussion prompt, we would like to listen to your reflections on today's presentation. Please feel free to share your thoughts. And has anything from today's presentation shaped the way you see the relationship between technology and the environment? Are there particular concepts or solutions that resonated with you? And the second question is, what potential risks or ethical considerations should we be mindful of regarding the use of emerging technologies like artificial intelligence? And the last one, considering the potential future scenarios that we discussed today, what do you believe should be our collective first priority in ensuring a sustainable and thriving future for both human societies and the environment? Thank you. Yeah, as uh, usually, let's not take a short break um, in order to enable uh, discussion and uh, first digestion and then we'll proceed to the discussion. And yes, during that break, maybe um, uh, keep the, the suggestions for the discussion, the questions. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm now going to stop recording and turn off the uh, video and we'll meet again in uh, three to four minutes, okay? And here we're back online and uh, ready to start the discussion. Uh, how about you all turn on your video for now? And uh, if you have some comment or some answer or some thoughts, please don't hesitate to share. You can just unmute yourself or raise your hand first. Um, 
yeah, I'm hoping for a lively discussion. And thanks again to the presenters for uh, including, for ending with suggestions for such discussion points. That's a great way to uh, start the discussion. Everybody turn on your camera. Uh, I think it would be a little awkward to start the first. So as a present in the tech, uh, emerging technologies from in my part, uh, I want to talk about my opinion to the second one. Uh, what I felt during my research was that most new technologies were not created with environmental factors in mind. Most of them require high, high power, which means, as we know, has a negative impact on the environment. So in other words, to help the environment, we need to apply new technologies ourselves, like uh, not just using technologies, uh, IoT technologies for controlling our air conditions that are remotely, we can use it for environmental monitoring, like that. So I think the way the technologies we use is important than the technology itself. Yeah, it's my opinion. Thank you. That's a great observation. Great. So maybe maybe to summarize, uh, yeah, it's the way that technology is used as well as the way that technology should be designed in future. Also design technology deliberately with the added perspective of its environmental impact. Is that correct? Okay, yes. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Thank you. Okay, next comment. Okay, so one, one observation <clears throat> is that the focus on technology, right? So technology kind of has uh, led us into this problem, right? So it's technologies that we have developed that also caused all the environmental problems. And uh, now we're trying to use technology to develop technology to solve the problems that we wouldn't have had <clears throat> without the te technology in the first place. Right. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is a, in, in computer science, there's this joke that <clears throat> uh, computer science, we try to solve problems that we wouldn't have had in the first place without computers. And maybe the same is now <clears throat> applies to technology. Now we're trying to develop technology to solve environmental problems that wouldn't be there in the first place without technology. So maybe <clears throat> using more technology <clears throat> to solve these problems is maybe is the wrong direction. Maybe should, we should actually uh, reduce uh, <clears throat> technology and uh, maybe we should return to <clears throat> earlier forms of living. Uh, that's a <clears throat> provocative thought. What are your opinion on that? There are no wrong answers, so just go ahead, be courageous, and share your thought. I think that's like really interesting way to think. Because, um, but I think like not particularly everyone would be opposed to for a future like that, because like we're using the technologies. We started to use like those. Uh, advanced technologies only recently, but we got used to the um, like user friendliness and how efficient they are. And I don't think people are going to give up their like level of comfort to the ecology matters. Yeah. However, that might be one of the solutions to for a brighter future, of course. And might be like if a lot of people 
are going to have consensus on this. There might be some, I don't know, countries that are going to give up, that are ready to accept the, how to say, the consequences of giving up the mm. technologies and going back to the traditional, um, like how we were living, the way we lived before. Yeah. Yes, that is also very true indeed. Uh, <clears throat> we tend to um, uh, think positively about the, the past, but actually <clears throat> the way people lived in the last previous century or centuries was pretty terrible uh, with lots of uh, people dying from illnesses, from malnutrition. Um, so yes, there's the, another joke that says, <clears throat> maybe we should go back up the trees and return to being apes. But yeah, uh, that uh, illustrates your point. Oh, this is not really a solution, right? Indeed. Thank you. So Damir is now uh, has turned on video. Damir? Yes, I had a question. In the beginning, we were talking about uh, mitigation and adaptation strategies, and they seem kind of polarized. So, can we find balance between them, or do you think that any of the strategy would be better for us and for the environment? So, between adaptation on the one hand and mitigation on the other hand. Is it possible to balance between them? That's your question, Damir, right? Yes, correct. I think that uh, to get the most effective result, we should uh, try to balance both adaptation and mitigation efforts. But personally, I believe that our focus should be mainly on mitigation efforts. If so, why? Because, okay, uh, in when it comes to adaptation, until when are we going to adapt? As the situation gets worse, if our solution is just adapting to it, it won't be a solution anymore. And this is just my personal opinion. What do you think, Damir? I think, yes, in theory, mitigation would be the best. However, um, we, as humanity, try so many efforts in combating and trying to reduce uh, wastes. But still, I think the efforts are very insignificant to have an impact. So to be prepared for the darker future, where humanity needs to and should to prepare, that's just a more realistic viewpoint. Okay, yes. I think Thank both you. perspectives uh, make sense. As usual, I mean, on, in this, on this topic, there are no rights or wrongs uh, answers. And it's important to, to think about such questions and to develop a mindset, uh, <clears throat> right? Also when developing top technology, to have a mindset that considers also other aspects such as the impact on the environment. How about the second or third discussion point? How about uh, 
uh, <clears throat> risk and ethical consideration to be mindful of. And that's <clears throat> what we just basically also what we just said, right? It uh, requires a, a <clears throat> change of perspective. Right? So when I was a student, uh, <clears throat> we would put all the, the garbage into the same bin, right? Uh, and since then, there has been huge progress. Now it's uh, common <clears throat> to separate garbage. So the mindset has already changed considerably. And also, as a consequence of this separation, the amount of glass garbage has drastically reduced, right? So if you look at the, the bins that collect <clears throat> um, uh, glass bottles, there are not so many uh, glass bottles in today's garbage. In, in my days, most of the beverages were sold in glass bottles. And they were not recycled; they were just, uh, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, thrown away. So there is uh, there is a significant progress uh, on the aspect of being mindful. Um, discussion point two. So what what is the next that we should uh, do in order to? Uh, in what direction should we change the mindset next? Yeah, just one, one example. Many of you are international students and you came here by plane. Also, I came here by plane. And uh, I travel a lot before the pandemic and after the pandemic, not during the pandemic. And all this flying creates a lot of mm, greenhouse impact, right? So my mindset tells me to reduce travel, particularly traveling by plane. On the other hand, there's a, a trend of globalization. We should, we do and we should visit other countries to improve uh, um, uh, awareness of other cultures and uh, acceptance and uh, uh, exchange with other uh, uh, peoples, right? So there's a, a trade-off. Uh, less travel means less <clears throat> global interaction. More travel means uh, more greenhouse uh, impact. So that's, uh, that's a difficulty about being mindful. Do right? you have any thoughts on that? If so, why don't we just have uh, Zoom meetings. Excellent. Yes. So, do we really need to travel all the miles to mm -hmm. speak and to talk? Good perspective. Yes. I agree. Yes. Yeah, we're actually running out of time. So last chance to add some remarks. I would like to uh, talk about one ethical consideration for the second question, uh, yeah. psychological manipulation. AI-powered algorithms, particularly in social media and advertising, have the potential to manipulate our thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. So manipula manipulation might be kind of useful in the context of environmental regeneration if we could be manipulated positively towards this. However, this could uh, raise concern about the ethics of using AI. And especially this days with that advancement of AI reaching very scary heights, we should really think about this. Wow, that's an excellent point. Yeah, kind of like manipulation as a new type of ecological footprint or impact on the world. Yes, 
And indeed, in many countries, <clears throat> propaganda is a very important part of, of the government, right? Um, in the war, there's propaganda, <clears throat> pro-Russian, anti-Russian propaganda. Um, and yeah, <clears throat> in China, it's uh, the, the media are very tightly controlled. So propaganda is a new kind of uh, um, uh, pollution, right? <laughs> Social pollution, and you point out that AI might be a, a, a tool to to fuel such um, social uh, or emotional pollution. Is that a correct perspective? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, yes, so time is up. Let's all thank the three speakers, the three presenters one more time. And um, now I'm gonna stop recording.